spending time with, with Pastor Joey, um, I've gotten to a point in life that I begin to really value friendship. You know, some of us, we went through a pandemic, but some of the people that we love didn't make it out. And I lost some of my best friends and family members in the pandemic. So now when God sends people in my life, I realize he's not just sending a person. Every person that God sends is also a form of provision. <laughs> and so I, I never try to take the people that God sends in my life and make them familiar. Because I want to always honor the gifts that God sends into my life. So I'm honored to be here that you trust me with this assignment. 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. Now I'm going to go ahead and give you a warning. Uh, this is not just a sermon. It's also surgery. Are y'all ready? I was praying on yesterday. God does celebrate nine years. And I looked up what the biblical meaning of nine meant. And I got three meanings of what it meant. The second one is what I feel the Holy Spirit gave me attention to. The first one was the judgment of God. I'm like, okay, all right. Come on, Holy Spirit. You can hear the judgment of God. Like, come on now. <laughs> but it was the second one that blew my mind. Nine literally means the perfect move of God. And the Holy Spirit showed me. I'm already, I feel like the word of the Lord for this house today is this. Here it is, that this nine years doesn't just represent nine years in the natural, it also represents nine months in the spiritual. I don't know if you've ever been pregnant with a dream, ever been pregnant with a vision, but I'm speaking that Fresh Church is getting ready to birth what God really put in it. I want to speak to it. All my dream was, are y'all ready for this word today? Here it is, and it reads, here it is, everybody. Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up, fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him. And he became crippled. I want to teach from the topic today. Here it is, everybody. Winning while wounded. Winning while wounded. You can be seated in the Lord's house. Winning while wounded. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. This is our winning season. But if this is your winning season... We must, learn we must learn how to keep winning, to keep winning. While, wounded. while wounded. Have you ever been wounded by somebody that you were supposed to be winning with? <laughs> Just because everyone in your life has a place does not mean that everyone in your life should be in the same place. And so it is key to not only have the right people in our life, but watch this, everybody, to also have the right people in the right places in our life. In other words, just because people pursue where they want to be in your life does not mean that's where they need to be in your life. Because different seasons will require different seats. Y'all, I feel the love over here. Can I say it again? Different seasons will require different seats, which means that some people that may have been in one seat in the past season may not need to be in the same seat in this new season. Do I have anybody in Fresh Church already in this message that's saying, God, give me the discernment to see, watch this, not just the season that you're blessing me with, but the seats that I need to put the right people in. Here it is, everybody. Write this down. Because just because someone is a good person does not mean that they're good for you. 
I feel my help. Can I say it again for the people in the back and the people in the chat? Just because someone is a good person does not mean that they're good for you. This is what happens even in the beginning. Adam fell not because he ate from a tree that was bad. He ate fruit that was actually good. Which means your greatest breakthrough in life will become when you're able to discern not between good and bad, but between good and God. Y'all not having church. And I got a sneaky suspicion that this is the season where God is about to eliminate your appetite for settling for good. I don't know who I'm talking about. And this season, I don't want good relationships. I want God relationships. I don't just want good favor. I want God favor. I'm going to give you 30 seconds right now if you're praising God that he's shifting you from good to God. Y'all don't know how to praise God. My family is not just good. People are going to look at my family and say, that's nothing but God. My finances aren't just good, but my money... People are going to look at you in this next season and say, that's nothing. But God, you're not going to have to tell them with your lips. They're just going to look at your life and say, that's nothing. But God, just having the right people in the right place will make you better. But watch this. Having the right people in the wrong place has the potential to make you bitter. And there's nothing worse than a bitter believer. <laughs> there's nothing worse than a bitter believer. Because you'll build your belief system not off of the Bible, but off of your brokenness. I feel like having church in the room today. And so watch this, you limit God to only being savior and not leader. And when you do this, you limit Jesus to watch this, only fixing what's broken. Because you can't handle what's blessed. Are y'all hearing this? I'm working, here it is everybody, because we become bitter out of our belief that God will not punish the people that hurt us. So we, try, we get hurt, and if we become bitter, we attempt to try to treat God like he's our do boy. God, I love you, but I need to get my lick back. Do I have any lick back saints in the church? That you love God, but you struggle with fighting to get your lick back. But here it is. Here's why you have to get free from getting your lick back. Getting your lick back is when you allow the person that broke your heart to also break your character. I don't need my lick back. Vengeance is mine. <laughs> if you be still <laughs> and allow the Lord to fight your battles, he got hand. Y'all not. But, but watch this, everybody. I want you to catch this because... We become bitter out of belief that God will not punish the people who hurt us. And since God is not going to intervene how we prefer for him to intervene, we become judge, jury, and executioner to those people, places, and things that hurt us. Watch this. So now we end up focusing on only fighting our enemies when we should be fighting for our destiny. Yeah. <laughs> Write this down. Take a picture of it if it's on the screen. Here it is. Bitterness is the result of unprocessed anger becoming our primary attitude. Bitterness is the result of unprocessed anger becoming our primary attitude. If you're not careful, it becomes a cycle. That the more you dwell on it, the deeper you get lost in it. And here it is, everybody. I want you to check this out. Hebrews 12, 15, it says this. Watch out that no bitter root of unbelief rises up among you. Check this out. For whenever it springs up, 
Many are corrupted by its poison. I'm going to read it again because you don't know when to shout. Many are corrupted by its poison. So bitterness is not about pain. Bitterness is about poison. Pain is when you get bit. Poison is when you become bitter. And some of us, we're shouting because we survive bites. Not realizing that the bite was not about the bite. The bite came to make you bitter. So you're shouting that you survived the pain. And the devil is shouting because he made you poison. Yes, you survived the toxic relationship. But that toxic relationship made you bitter. <laughs> yes, you overcame the trauma. Yes, you're stepping into a new season. And you'll be surprised how many people are praising God with lifted hands with poisoned hearts. You can speak in tongues, but you can't forgive your neighbor. Are you hearing this? And I'm trying to get you to see this, everybody, that pain was never about your past. The enemy always sent pain, watch this, to keep you from your future. Are you hearing this? And so check this out. When this happens, we go from being cut in our past to it evolving to us being crippled in our future. I just preached the text and you don't even realize it. It's a hermeneutical loop. We're about to preach and learn about a man named Mephibosheth who was dropped. And once he got dropped, he became crippled. And once he became crippled, he can no longer walk at the pace that God created him to walk at. And what I'm trying to get you to see, that while he was crippled in his legs, many of us may have become crippled in our soul. And there's nothing like a soul wound. And here it is, everybody. I want you to check this out. When you become bitter, notice you don't become paralyzed. You just become crippled. Mephibosheth is not paralyzed. He's crippled. Paralyzed is when you're stuck. But crippled is when you a little slow. Y'all not having church with me. Because you think I'm talking about a physical crippleness. When some of us may not be physically crippled, we may be emotionally crippled. <laughs> that you finally got the new job, but you're not producing at the pace you could be producing at because your past crippled you. That you finally got the new relationship and God finally sent you a divine partner, but because of the pain of your past, you don't trust like you should. Cripple. Do I have anybody in the room today that's saying, God, I'm surrendering my heart to you because I don't want to walk into my future crippled. This is the case in our text today. In our text today, we see in chapter 4, verse 4, well, we are introduced to our main character. His name is Mephibosheth. He's the son, watch this, of Jonathan, the grandson of King Saul. You know Saul, the one that was jealous of King David. That when King David came on the scene, everybody started screaming, Saul has killed his thousands. But David? Oh, he killed tens of thousands. And Saul got mad. He got big mad. He wanted to argue. Hey, <laughs> argue. I'm sorry. And so here it is, everyone. I want you to catch this out. He's the grandson of a bitter grandfather. 
because whatever is not healed gets handed down. I feel like having church over here. This is why you got to prioritize your healing in this season because you cannot allow the hurt from your past to be passed down in the next generation. I dare you to praise God, not for you. Praise God that what hit you won't hit your children. No, you sitting in here like you're cute. Praise God that your children are blessed. Praise God for your children having a sound mind. Praise God for your children walking in prosperity because what hit me won't hit my children. And so, because Saul can't handle having high capacity people around him. Because when you become bitter, one of the fruits of bitterness is insecurity. And so God sends him, watch this, his divine replacement. But he sees his divine replacement, watch this, as intimidation, not realizing that David was actually grace. That he said, even though, Saul, I'm firing you. I'm not going to immediately remove you. So I'll send you provision in the form of David to help you do what you can no longer do. What is that? Overcome giants. And so here it is. Because he couldn't handle it, David is now on the other side fighting with Philistine army. You, you don't know when to shout, do you? Because when we meet David, he overcomes a Philistine giant. They sleep over there. I'm going to preach to y'all in a minute. When we meet David, he's fighting an enemy from where? They, they missed it. Maybe y'all will catch it. When we meet David, he's under attack from the Philistine army in one season. But when the tables turned or the season shifted, he's leading the Philistine army in the next season. Because whenever God has favor on your life, he'll even use your enemies to help you get to your destiny. And I don't know who I'm preaching to already in this message, but do I have some people in the room that's saying, God, open my heart because the help that I need may not come from the people I expected to help me, but even if you want to use my enemies, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. He'll make the people that was gossiping about you start blessing you. He'll make the people that was trying to steal from you start pouring back into you. He will make your enemies. And now, Mephibosheth's grandfather and father has gotten killed. Look at it. It's in the text in verse 4. They get the news that King Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. Watch this. He's five years old, and his nurse hears the news picks up Mephibosheth, who's five years old, and takes off running. But while she's running in fear, y'all yeah, caught it. This is my side right here. <laughs> while she's running in fear, carrying him, she fumbled him. She dropped. Now, I have four kids, and I've seen all my kids when they were five years old. Around the age they were five, I was no longer carrying them on my hip. Because fear will cause you to mismanage. Y'all not having church with me. 
you have to be careful with the people that you allow in your circle. Because if they're not operating by faith, they may be operating by fear, and they may drop you. They may, they may fumble your dream. They may fumble your heart. They may fumble your family. She drops Mephibosheth. Now, before we beat up the nurse, we have to understand why was she running? Because according to Jewish tradition back in the day, whenever a new king took the seat, he would kill the old king's entire lineage. Why? To make sure that the previous regime does not come back to try to take the, cr the cr uh, crown. Now watch this, everybody. In other words, she's running because she sees signs of an old pattern. If you know anything about David, he had a covenant with a man named Jonathan. Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, who just got dropped, is crippled. So she's running from something that looks like it could be like what it usually is in the past. In other words, she's triggered. But be careful when triggers become a trap. Because how people treat you says a lot about them. How you respond says a lot about you. And I don't know who I'm preaching to early on in this message, but do I have anybody in the room today that's saying, God, I need you to help me with how I respond. I don't be bothering nobody, but when people bother me, I got to watch because my hands start moving without my permission sometimes. She's on the run. She's afraid. And some of us have been on the run. So that stuff that took out our parents don't get us. They're on the run because his parents lost. So he literally becomes lame from his parents' losses. And I don't know who I'm preaching to already in this message, but are you on the run trying to make sure that it may have ran in my family until it ran into me? That this is the year I'm breaking generational cycles. That dysfunction may have had my parents and my grandparents, but dysfunction won't have me. That addiction may have ran in my family until it ran into me. That debt may have ran in my family until it ran into me. This is the year, watch this, that I'm reversing every curse. I wonder, do I have some men in here that say I may not have had a father present in my life, but my children will have a present father in their life? Do I have some women in the room today that may have said I may not have had all the wisdom I need growing up, but I will give the wisdom for those who are coming after me? It may have ran in my family until it ran in to me. She's afraid. Fear drove her to pick him up run away, and she dropped him. She, she dropped him. It's one thing when you hurt yourself. But what do you do when you're dealing with the pain of somebody else's mistake? Can I ask you a question? Can you lean in? I want to ask you a real question. Y'all just going to look at me? I, Y'all ready? Have you ever been dropped? See, being dropped is not about peers. He was not dropped by your friend.
He was not dropped by someone that was on his level. He was dropped by someone he trusted to lead. He, he was dropped. And watch this, everybody. Here it is. What's a drop? I'm so glad you asked. Write this down. Don't forget this. A drop is when someone who's responsible for making you better irresponsibly makes you worse. I feel my help all over the place now. A drop is when someone who's responsible for making you better irresponsibly makes you worse. A drop is something that you never saw coming. And it has the potential to cripple you. You know you've been dropped when you now have authority issues. Have you ever been dropped by a mentor? Have you ever been dropped by a parent? Have you ever been dropped by a leader? And I don't know about you. Here's why you should praise God. Because for some of us, even if he had to reach way down, Jesus still came and picked us up. But watch this. He, watch this. He doesn't always come in the form of himself. Sometimes God will use a divine replacement to give you what you didn't get from the person you expected it from. So yes, you may not have had a parent, but sometimes God will send you a pastor. And I came to preach the fresh church this morning that maybe you didn't get what you need in one place, but why don't you praise God that he sent a divine replacement in the form of Pastor Joey and Pastor Sonia to help cover you when you may were dealing with some crippleness. Watch this. I want you to catch this. She dropped him because she was carrying something she didn't have the capacity to carry. And when she dropped him, the text literally says, watch this, somebody, that he becomes lame in both feet. He becomes lame. Where? Okay. He becomes lame. Where? See, you, you don't know when to shout. He becomes lame. Where? See, see, I studied this so I know what's about to happen. I ran around my neighborhood ten times when I saw what being lame in both feet meant. Because some of us, we've been investing time and energy in where we see the crippleness. But being lame in both feet does not mean you were dropped on your feet. The feet is only a symptom. Not the source. Literally, to be lame in both feet was a local colloquialism that literally meant he was dropped on his head. Can we have church for at least one minute right here? He broke his feet because he bumped his head. And I don't know who I'm preaching to already in this, in this church today. If you can get your mind out... You can get your feet out. And I wonder, do I have anybody in the room today that said my feet may be struggling right now, but I'm declaring that my mind is coming out. That I may be in one season, but God is shifting my mind to another season. Maybe this is why the Bible says we walk by faith and not by. I wonder, do I have somebody in the room today that can stand up and just start walking around in your section because my Bible says wherever your feet touches, it's on land that I'm giving you that I'm moving my feet as evidence of me moving my mind. Because wherever God is taking you, you're going to get there head When you can get your mind out, you can get your marriage out. When you get your mind out, you can get your money out. When you get your mind out, you can get your heart out. When you get your mind out, you can get your health out. I dare you to praise God right now. Not that he's changing something on the outside, but he's changing something on the inside. 
in a relationship, but you won't break your mind. What's broken that broke you? It's crippled. His feet not working, so he's wounded. And watch this. Be careful with who you trust with your wounds. Because while he's wounded, she carries him to a place called Lodabar. Low means no. Dabar means word. So he's wounded with no word. See, life is not about being wounded. Life is about how do you handle your wounds. So he's in a place with no word while he's wounded because the word will turn your wounds into wisdom. The word will turn your wounds into worship. The word will turn your wounds into winning. And I wonder, do I have anybody in the room today that's glad that even when you were wounded, you can come here every Sunday and still get you a word? I don't know who I'm preaching to, but somebody shout, I need my word. When I want to give up, I need the word to keep me going. What word do you need? I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed breaking bread. I feel my help because good quotes won't heal you. The word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path, which means if I have no word when I'm wounded, I'm damaged with no discernment. And this is why many of us feel stuck. Because we got wounded. With no word. She carried him to a place with no word. You know, one thing I love about this church is when I came in here, I, I sensed the presence of God. And I don't know about you. Sometimes we can pl take places like this for granted. But what I am telling you, that when you come here, watch this, you don't know how God is using the word, whether it's a weapon or medicine. And sometimes he'll give you a prescription to put in your cabinet, not for the hurt that you're in right now. But he sees somebody you trust in a whole lot that may betray you in the future. But because you already are filled up with the word, it may cut you, but it won't cripple you. And he says, I'm crippled. I'm in Lodabar. Then all of a sudden, King David has taken the throne. He's in the palace. And God drops on his mind. Is there anybody? Y'all don't know how to have church. From the family of Saul. Still living. See, y'all don't know when to have church, fresh church. I'm trying to have church. It's nine years. And you don't realize what's happening with David and Mephibosheth is about to happen for you. Well, he's in Lodabar thinking that this is where he will spend the rest of his life. That he will never recover what was lost. God put it on somebody's mind. 
to start asking about you. Because everybody don't have to like you just the right person. And I wonder do I have some people in the room today that's praying, God, I pray that you put me on the, on the mind of the right people. Watch this. Somebody says, Saul has a son named Mephibosheth. I think they hide. Well, we know where they are. We got the location. We put the air tag on them. That's for about five toxic people right there. <laughs> Here it is. He think no one knows where he is. But watch this. David says, go get him and bring him to me. I want to preach this like I feel it. David is a leader who has a vision to go and reach those who are crippled. And he has other leaders in place that can go and carry back lame people and bring them to the table. What will happen, Fresh Church? When God gives a vision to Pastor Joey and Pastor Sonia, that he can trust multiple vision carriers to go back into the city, into the world, and bring those who are lame back to the table. See, some of us, we only see ourselves like Mephibosheth. But what if I'm suggesting to you in the text today that maybe God is not calling you to be Mephibosheth in this season? He's calling you to be the carriers in this season. Because what do you do when you have a vision but it's being aborted by lack? But what if what you make happen for God's house, he'll make happen for your house? Y'all not having church for me. Uh-oh. Who was Mephibosheth on the run from? David's men. Who's coming back to carry him? Because God will take what was meant to kill you in one season to carry you in the next season. In other words, what the enemy meant for evil, God is getting ready to turn it around for your good. I dare you to praise God right now for the turnaround. turning around. I said it's turning around. I felt that. It's turning around. I don't know what you felt stuck at, but it's turning around. I don't know what's been laying down dormant. It's turning around. That God is getting ready to send some provision, some help, some people that can help pick you back up and bring you to the king's table. Somebody shout it's turning around. Turning around. Now, this this is what blessed me right here. We're closing out. Can you imagine with all of the faith in the room? What the Lord can do. I can only imagine if you're Mephibosheth and you've been in hiding and now you're crippled. Now, here's what you're missing. He was an heir to the throne. So he had not lived in poverty ever in his life. He was used to prosperity. He was used, watch this, to protection. Everything that he may have put his security and trust in was taken away. And what if sometimes God will take some of your earthly security that that dream job or that dream house or that dream relationship that you had put all of your security and trust in, what if he said, I'm going to take that away from you 
because you develop an unhealthy codependency. And you start trusting in that more than you were trusting in me. And he says, bring them to me. Now, here's what, here's what confused me in the text. I never saw Mephibosheth's feet get healed. They picked him up brought him to the king's table and set him down. He was crippled, but he was still called. That's for about five of you in the room today that you are expecting to get to a certain place and arrive where certain things get fixed. That God said, no, you can come to me broken and all. I'll use your broken pieces and turn them into a masterpiece. Because when you're sitting at my table, we can't see what's wrong with your feet anyway. Y'all not having church with me. In other words, he said, I'm going to cover you. Do I have anybody in the room that's saying, God, I thank you that I'm covered. I thank you that I'm covered, that you covered my ignorance that you covered my foolishness, that you covered my addictions. Somebody said, I'm covered. You sitting here today, when was the last time you thanked God that he didn't allow you to be exposed? I'll cover you. You crippled, but you chosen. And when you sit at the table, they can't tell the difference between you and kings. Be careful if you're judging other people's crippleness because you don't know the call on their life. Watch this. Because you can't heal what you don't feel. And for some of you, you have been hiding and silent about some of the stuff that God brought you out of when God is saying, that's the very thing that I want to use to reach the people that I sent to your life. And I want you to hear me right here, everybody. They brought him back to the king's table. And God will use what wounded you in the past to help you win in the future. They were on the run from David's men, but now David's men are carrying him back to the king's table. I'm going to give you three marching orders, Fresh Church. I want you to write this down, and I believe this is the word or marching orders for you for this next season. Because if you're going to win while wounded, number one, you're going to have to release your entitlement. Release your entitlement because oftentimes we think we're owed an explanation nah, why me why this why that I deserve better than this but sometimes it's hard for us to win because we focus more on what we think we deserve what if God is looking at you saying oh you want me to give you what you really deserve entitlement. It's spiritual cancer. When you have entitlement, you don't get watch this, defeated by the enemy. You get defeated by your inner me. That the devil don't even have to attack you because you keep attacking you. When most people are trying to fight giants in the land, God is saying, no, I need you to overcome the giants in your heart. I am telling you right now, this church is pregnant. But what have you grown entitled to about this church? That God is saying, no, the same way I use this 
to bring you to the table. It's the way now I want to use you to bring others to the table. What if the men that David told to go and get Mephibosheth got, said, I ain't got time for that. I'm comfortable in the palace. Have you been choosing the palace over your purpose? My assignment in this earth is, is to restore back in the kingdom the spirit of the two. Because while everyone else is trying to be the one, God is saying, I need some people who are willing to decrease, humble themselves, and be a faithful number two. And watch this, it's not about position. It's about posture. Because being a number two is being like Jesus. Jesus said, I only see, do what I see the Father. And for some of you right now, that means that you may have to release your preferences. If you're saying, God, forgive me for being a slave to what I prefer. This is the final test that Jesus faced before the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane. His preference. He looked in the cup and said, is there another way? I don't prefer this. Nevertheless, you got to have a nevertheless in your spirit. Not my will, but your will be done. And this is why they couldn't kill him on the cross. Because he killed himself in the garden. You can't kill a dead person. And I wonder do I have some people in the room today that say, Lord, crucify my flesh. I keep getting in your way. In this season, don't just bless me, make me. You have to release your entitlement. Entitlement is spiritual cancer. It spreads. It impacts your decision making and it impacts your circle. Number two, redirect your expectations. Redirect your expectations. Peace does not just come from right prayers. Peace also comes from right thinking. What do you do when you're praying right but thinking wrong? See, I'm telling you right now, this is going to change your experience with God. That for some of us, your prayer life has become stale because your th thought life was never renewed. So you would seek God for mind relief, not mind renewal. So when you go into the presence of God to pray, you really were going to God to escape from life. When God said, no, you come to me to be equipped for life. That I'm not going to change your situation. I'm going to change the way you see it in my presence. And so now when you go back into your life, you see it the way I see it because my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than... Yes, Lord. And so many people are struggling because they're expecting the right things from the wrong people. Can I be honest? I've been in ministry now for a while. And one of the things that God did for me over the past 12 years was walk me through some emotional, mental healing that I had never seen in the generation before me. That there's this bridge that he gave me revelation for between therapy and theology. And I realized in our community with church, it also has to act as a surrogate parent. 
because we're not just having to be discipled from where we are. We also have to be discipled from the absence of those who didn't give us what we needed before we got here. And so we come and we shout we're blessed, but don't know how to deal with our blind spots. And so I'm, I'm saying all that to say this, expecting the right things from the wrong people. In other words, that sometimes I can come and connect in church and expect the church to be heaven. That nobody has issues. Nobody can make mistakes. And the moment I'm offended, I got church hurt. When the question is, no, did I ever heal from what hurt me before I even got to this? Because sometimes we call that hurt, which is really correction. And so, watch this. We have to redirect our expectations because you can never experience what you, what you don't have the faith to expect. When you walked in here this morning, what were you expecting? Who came to Fresh Church this morning with expectation? Who came here believing that God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ever ask, think, dream, or imagine? Who's expecting God to do something that will blow your mind? I'm going to give you 60 seconds right now and put your expectations in the atmosphere. I dare you to tell God what you're expecting over your life. Tell him what you're expecting over your future. Come on, open up your mouth and begin to pray with great expectation. Come on, somebody. Open up your mouth and... Until you stand, can you stand to your feet all over the building? I'm closing out right here. If you want to remain seat, seated because you're having a moment with God, feel free to do that. But I want everyone in the posture of worship right here. Because number one, the first march in order is to remove your what? Remove your what? Number two, release, I mean, I'm sorry, redirect your. Now here's the last one. Rebuild your endurance. I'm going to speak this over your pastors, and I'm also speaking it to you. God has given you a new oil for this new season. That sounds simple to you, but what I am telling you that most people burn out. And don't finish the race because they keep going into new seasons with old oil. I speak fresh oil over your life. I speak fresh oil over this church. And you don't know when to pray and intercede for your leaders. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. If you can't pray right now, pray for your leaders right now. God, I say thank you that you're anointing their hands to prosper, anointing their hearts to lead, anointing their ears to hear, anointing their eyes to see. Wherever their feet touches, new oil, new seasons. Because being wounded can also lead to you always being weary. And it's hard to win when your soul is weary. You don't know what these first nine years took out of them. And we're praying that God pour back into you double. Yes, Lord. 30, 60, 100 yes, fold. Everything you've poured out. 
And I, as I was praying over this message, I was like, Holy Spirit, help me to see why this text. And I saw it, I believe, in verse 7. 2 Samuel 9, verse 7. It says, don't be afraid. Mephibosheth finally gets in the palace. He says, don't be afraid, David said to him. I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? He says, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will always eat at my table. And I don't know where this came from, but I believe the Holy Spirit has land. Yes, Lord. With yes, your name on it. But I'm coming against past wounds that limited your vision to believe for it. I come against the myth that because real estate is high in this region, that you will limit God. I believe that God is about to do exceedingly and abundantly that he's releasing property, real estate, and land for the vision that he's placed in your heart. Generations will be blessed because of you. So, Father, we pray right now. Like the Father in the Bible who said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. We confront the unbelief in our heart. Help us to trust in you fully. I declare, God, that oftentimes we pray for a corporate anointing. That's already here. God, I pray a special prayer over this house that you're releasing the gift of faith over this church. That this is a church that doesn't only believe in Jesus, but also believes like Jesus. That this is a church that's not like Peter stepping out of the boat, walking on water. But this is a church that will follow the example of Jesus that's standing on the water, calling others out of the boat. I declare a greater measure of faith. I come against playing it safe. I come against the spirit of fear. God, I say thank you that the vision is being enlarged and expanded. I, I thank you that leaders are being raised up. I pray a special prayer, Holy Spirit. I feel you. That you're releasing a heart of generosity over this church. Because this is a safe haven that believers can trust. So, God, I say thank you that when our hearts are healed, we begin to trust you radically like never before. God, I say thank you that you're opening the floodgates of heaven, pouring out a blessing so much that we don't have enough room to receive it. I declare cancer will be healed in this church. Tumors will be dissipated in this church. Supernatural miracle signs and wonders will happen through this ministry. We give you honor, we give you glory, we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. I dare you to give God praise, right?